thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, this is my disclosure slide. So I'm going to focus on the Acumen Hypotension Prediction Index software and give an overview of the monitor's graphic interface, what the actual HPI number represents, and discuss the three other parameters displayed in the secondary screen, which is SVV, DP by DT, and EA Dime. We're then going to discuss some of the clinical applications. So when a patient is admitted to the hospital for major surgery or into the intensive care unit, it's very common for us to have an arterial catheter in place. Uh, the catheter uses uh, a signal from a transducer and displays a continuous beat-to-beat -beat blood pressure. The blood pressure helps uh, us know that we're delivering adequate perfusion to the body and tissues. And it's also extremely useful because it gives us beat-to-beat -beat, uh, display of the, of the circulation. What we're looking at here is a typical arterial waveform uh, with just a single waveform broken down into its different components. And I think we're all aware that from the different parts of the waveform, we can interpret what's going on with the patient's physiology. So at the start of the waveform and the upstroke, we've got the effect of contractility. Uh, we've then got uh, the peak of the systolic waveform and the aortic compliance effect. Uh, then we've got the dichrotic notch. And then we've got the diastolic phase, which uh, is obviously proportional to what's going on with the flow through the vessels and the afterload or peripheral resistance, which is the diastolic phase. We use arterial waveform analysis every day. Uh, because it's so simple and relatively safe and cheap, it gives us uh, a real display of the circulation. But it doesn't just give us systolic and diastolic blood pressure. We learn a lot from the waveform, the shape, the upstroke, and the pulse pressure and stroke volume variation, which we can use during the respiratory cycle. So when you have a ventilated patient at about eight mils per kilo, tidal ventilation, pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation can be very accurate uh, indicators that you've got adequate preload for your patient. In fact, really, when you think of it, I'm talking about HPI today, and we are, as clinicians, performing our own physiological analysis and interpretation every time we're looking at arterial waveform. So I'd like to illustrate this with a real-life case from one of my previous hospitals. Uh, I worked in a large cancer centre, and we did an awful lot of uh, major oncological resections, uh, it's particularly liver resections both open and laparoscopic. And what we did was use a technique to reduce secondary bleeding by using low pulse pressure uh, anesthesia and control the circulation and blood flow to the liver. So the surgeon did their bit by reducing blood flow by using the accuser, but we also had a vitally important time uh, during surgery by basically we would use low CVC, so we, we, we would effectively dehydrate the patient and also drop the pulse pressure. And this had two effects. It reduced splanchnic blood flow and also hepatic artery blood flow. So the liver could be resected with minimal blood loss. I'd like to show some uh, video from such a case. Uh, and you can see uh, as I play these videos that the top right is our baseline, and then the bottom left video plays. And you can see that the heart rate is about 63, the blood pressure 85 over 55, and then we've got a constant MAC of about, uh, or end tidal CV fluorine of 1.2, and constant CO2 of 4.0. But as the uh, surgery actually proceeds, you can see from the next video, that despite all the other parameters remaining the same, the blood pressure goes down and the patient becomes hypotensive. So despite the fact that we're trying to maintain our physiology constant, it can be very hard for us as clinicians to detect this hypotension. So wouldn't it be wonderful to have a monitor that could look at the whole arterial waveform and predict this change? And that's exactly what our HPI is doing. So HPI looks at the whole arterial waveform and the relationship between the different components, not just those three different phases. 
And I think you're all aware, again, on the next slide, when after a liver resection and we've got hypotension, low pulse pressure, as we fill the patient with intravenous fluid boluses, the systolic and diastolic blood pressure increases, as does the pulse pressure, a reflection of increased volume stretching the arterial tree and increased tone. Uh, and this is reflected when we use the HPI de device in real life as well. So HPI is a first of its kind technology, which can predict the likelihood of a patient trending towards a hypotensive event. And we define hypotension as a mean arterial pressure less than 65 millimeters of mercury for less than one minute. And it's a very rich physiological signal, the arterial line, as I've already elucidated. Um, and the waveform gives us information about strength of contractility, how much blood is ejected, uh, and how compliant or stretchy the blood vessels are. There are over 2.6 million different features that can be derived from the blood pressure uh, waveform. And on the next slide, um, what this shows is that not all of the features will be important uh, or specifically predictive, but where machine learning comes in, there were from 2.6 million features, two machine learning techniques were applied to identify what ended up as the 23 most predictive features. These features are not just single characteristics, but a combination of factors which incorporate how different characteristics interact with each other. So the data set included over 1,300 patients. This might not sound like a large number, but when you consider uh, the physiological data that was collected, the number of patients provided over 130 million individual heartbeats. So what is the actual HPI number? It comes on a scale of 1 to 100. The higher the number, the higher the likelihood that hypotension i.e. a mean arterial pressure of less than 65 millimetres of mercury occurring for a minute or more, will occur the shorter the time to the event. So, for example, on this slide, uh, I've highlighted the HPI range of 85 to 89. And that gives you a likelihood that the patient will have a low blood pressure of around about 90%, and the average time to the event is five minutes, with a range of two to 10 minutes. This is an example of an individual patient. On the top, we're looking at the mean arterial blood pressure of the patient. When that patient uh, blood pressure falls below 65 millimeters of mercury, that's what we define as hypotension. And that's where, as we know, the increased risk of kidney injury and myocardial injury occur. The bottom graph is the HPI number. And you can see that HPI reached the alert threshold of 85 or more uh, before around about 15 minutes before that actual hypotensive event occurred. The blood pressure remained stable during that time. So as a clinician, you might not be expecting a change. And I think I illustrated that with the two videos. And then suddenly the blood pressure can fall away quite quickly. So the advantage of the system, it gives the clinician almost a 15 minute heads up that something is about to change and that you can actually do something, be proactive and intervene to control that low blood pressure or, or actually decide what you need to do to affect the change. And that's where the secondary screen comes in and I'll come to that very shortly. So some of the evidence base behind it, this is one of the studies that supports the use of the technology in the clinical setting in surgical patients. And they showed that in over 300 patients, the HPI was very reliable at predicting hypotension. And there was no other real hemodynamic parameter that we can rely on in the same way. So how can we use this technology in clinical practice? We can use it in the operating room to reduce hypotension perioptively. But I'd like to propose we can also use the technology in the post-opsive or critical care space. So using HPI, we can be proactive to reduce the amount of hypotension that our patients have. And this is important because we know that over 50% of hypotensive events are in the uh, 12 hours following surgery, not always in the operating room. 
Also, we can use it as a bedside decision-making tool to help us decide how we can fix the hypotension. I'll give some examples of that shortly. There are also new parameters that might prove clinically useful to titrate vasopressors. The Acumen HPI software is comprised of three key elements. The first is the HPI parameter, which I've already shown you. And then when this reads more than 85 for two consecutive 20 second readings or reaches 100, an alarm pops up, which prompts you to go to the secondary screen. On the secondary screen, we can then view the other parameters, stroke volume variation, DPDT, and EA Dyne, and work out what the likely cause of the hypotension will be. This is a view of the secondary screen. In the top right hand, you can see the HPI parameter. So just to remind you, so that's in red at the moment. It displays a value ranging from 0 to 100 and with higher values indicating the higher likelihood of a hypotensive event. And it's updated every 20 seconds. If the value exceeds 85, the auditory alarm will sound. And if the HPI parameter exceeds 85 for two consecutive readings or reaches 100 at any time, the pop-up window will appear, prompting you to review the patient's hemodynamics using the secondary screen. So the first thing we can review is the stroke volume variation, which, as you all know, is the percentage difference between minimum and maximum stroke volume during a respiratory cycle. So that's really reflecting preload. The next is DP by DT. And the arterial DP by DT is the maximum upslope of the arterial pressure waveform measured from a peripheral artery. The trend values of DP DT may be an indicator of increasing or decreasing contractility. And finally, EA Dyne, which is dynamic elastance. EA Dyne is simply the ratio of PPV to SVV. It's a measure of the afterload to the left ventricle by the arterial system relative to the left ventricular elastance. So in the same way we consider dynamic parameters like SVV to predict fluid responsiveness, EA Dyne has been shown to be an indicator of pressure responsiveness, predicting if blood pressure will increase in response to fluid administration in preload responders, but it should only be considered when a patient is fluid responsive. It's not a valid measure of pressure response in preload independent individuals. These two clinical trials showed how using Acumen HPI software in combination with the therapeutic protocol, clinicians managed to proactively implement strategies that reduce the incidence and duration of intraoperative hypotension. I did something very similar myself at my last institute in the operating room in cardiac surgery. And here you have a picture of us using the HPI software. We use the technology, and despite us using multiple inotropes and vasopressors, you can see that we actually had a very high sensitivity and specificity at both 5, 10, and 15 minutes. And these were confirmed by our rock curves on the left. So using the secondary screen allows you to have a deep dive into the trend of SVV, DPDT, and EA Dyne, and adjust your vasopressor or inotropic infusions accordingly. When we did the data collection, we used something called the Acumen Analytics software. And this tracks hypotension and duration, and even can track other things like cardiac index. And it was very useful for us when we wanted to instigate a hemodynamic uh, optimization platform for our patients, because we could map what practice was and then see how we changed and see if we had an effect on the number of hypotension episodes. Finally, I'd like to introduce uh, an interesting paper to whet your appetite of how this new technology can be used. This paper studied septic patients and measured EA Dyne before reducing the infusion rate of norepinephrine. So they were basically stable on ventilated patients with stable norepinephrine and fluid requirements. And EA Dyne was measured 
you might be asking how was stroke volume measured in these patients, and it was using the PICO thermodilution technique. So by knowing stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variation, you can work out your EA dyne. And they mapped EA dyne and looked to see what your risk of your mean arterial pressure dropping if you actually reduced your norepinephrine infusion rate. And the results were very impressive. They showed that an EA dyne less than 0.94 predicted a decrease in your mean arterial pressure with a rock curve of 0.87 if you actually reduced your norepinephrine. So what that means in, in real life is if you've got an EA dyne of less than 0.94, you probably shouldn't be weaning your norepinephrine because the patient's going to become hypotensive. Whereas those with higher values, you're safe to do a trial of uh, weaning of norepinephrine. I'd like to summarize by showing the secondary interface screen. The mean arterial pressure and cardiac output are displayed along with the HPI, in this case, 86 out of 100. Preload is represented by stroke volume variability and contractility is represented by DP to DT. Afterload is represented by dynamic arterial elastance, EA dying. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to taking some questions later.